Welcome to the Labyrinth. I'm your host, Pratham Padav. My guest today is Jayanth Bandari. He is an investor and an entrepreneur. He is a contributing editor for the Liberty magazine. And he has written on political, economic, and cultural issues for numerous publications. He is of Indian origin, but he is currently a Canadian. He runs an annual philosophy seminar in Vancouver, Canada called Capitalism and Morality. This is his second time on the labyrinth because I enjoy talking to him. And if you enjoy this podcast, do like, share, subscribe, hit the bell icon and leave a comment below. And if you want to support this podcast, join the Labyrinth community. Memberships are now open. Jayanth, welcome back to the Labyrinth. Uh, uh, Pratham, uh, thanks uh, very much for having me again. And welcome back to India. Did you <laughs> miss India? <laughs> Uh, well, no, I never miss India, Pratham, but uh, I am uh, in the process of writing a book on India. And the Wonderful. best place to write a book on India is to be in India. Uh, because once I'm in the US or once I am in Europe, it becomes very difficult to write about India because everything looks so distant and so uh, unrealistic because India is a planet by itself it you have to be in this country to be able to write about cows and the poop of cows on the road the crazy traffic something that seems unrealistic when you're not in the country so i'm back in india for a while but uh, so here i am okay so where are you located which state are you in uh, I am currently in Madhya Pradesh, uh, which is uh, where I have historically spent a lot of time, but I will be spending uh, some time in Mom Mumbai and New Delhi and Chennai over the next few weeks. Okay. So what is your new, what is your book about? Well, I want to talk about the extreme irrationality, superstitious nature of Indians and why this country is destined to be a poor place to live in um, and why I see absolutely no hope from this country. Now, why should I be writing a, about a country that from which I have no hopes? Uh, because uh, I want to discourage um, people from investing in India because most of them will lose their money investing in this country. And, you know, Pratham, I have historically uh, consulted with major multinational companies on why not to invest in, in India. And they bring me on board because I can talk about things that the regular bureaucrat is afraid of talking about. I can talk about why India is not a profitable place to invest in. Uh, now, of course, uh, Pratham, you can make money in India. And I have been involved in a few ventures in the country which made a lot of money. But for a country, for for India in general, there is absolutely no future. Uh, and we have to come to terms with that. Uh, uh, and then once you come to terms with what is the truth and what is the reality, maybe you can live in this country and f adjust around it. But if you fool yourself, uh, then you personally cannot have a good life in India. And these companies will lose money. And these young girls who come to India to on a, on travels will be uh, will suffer problems so all i want people is to understand the true facts and then learn from what it is rather than go back with a mythical understanding of this country you said a lot of girls will come here and suffer why do you think so many white girls fetishize india uh, well it, it's very funny pratham i have uh, in the past had several white girls coming to India by themselves, some of my friends, and every single of them was sexually assaulted. Uh, now, they did not necessarily were raped, but they were touched inappropriately. They faced problems in this country. Um, so the problem is that when I tell them, warn them about it, they often don't like it because they think I'm being sexist. Uh, and when they return back to the West, they don't 
the West has become so politically correct that these girls will not tell the full true story about India. What I want to do is to talk about the truth the way it is, which does not mean it has anything bad to say about an individual Indian. It only means that what you are going to face when you come to India. And once you are prepared for what might, what you might encounter, uh, you will actually have a decent time here because then you will be prepared for what will come your way. Okay. I think most Indians have adjusted already. We do certain things to make sure that we are not cheated, that we don't get assaulted, harassed because we are so conditioned to living here. Whereas foreigners, when they think of India, they probably think of yoga and Varathanatyam and mangoes and the land of enlightened gurus that they are not aware of the others, the dark side of India. Uh, well, uh, yeah, and I'm not sure when you say uh, Indians are adjusted to India. I mean, a cockroach is adjusted to living in a sewage. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, yes, you can get adjusted, but you are still a cockroach. Uh, Indians have a very nasty life here. It's a country where an individual who calls himself an, a spiritual person or he talks great about the greatness of the country. But, uh, you know, the reality is that an average Indian is extraordinarily stressed and it shows on the faces of Indians. Once they are past their 30 years uh, age, you see their face uh, uh, showing extreme stress. Uh, they, they become increasingly disabled as they grow older because they eat a lot of comfort food uh, because they are so stressed. So, uh, yes, they are adjusted to living here. And that is exactly why this country is not growing out of its problems. Because if you adjust yourself to misery and wretchedness and poverty and humiliation, uh, then, uh, yes, uh, you live a depraved life because you have adjusted yourself to a degenerate life. Uh, but what if you are an upper middle class person? Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't you have a better life in India than abroad? Because here you can afford a hundred servants and buy a huge land and you can have bureaucrats in your pocket. Uh, well, absolutely. And uh, uh, Pratham, you know, this is something that comes up quite often. When I came to India in 1991 to start uh, Indian operations of a European company, uh, I was among the better paid people in the country. Um, the, the reality is that, yes, I had a lot of money, uh, but I had no privacy. Uh, if I wanted to go somewhere, I needed a chauffeur to drive me there which meant that I did not, could not really drive by myself or with my family or friends. Uh, there was always an external person in there. Uh, I don't necessarily enjoy having servants walking around me. I want my own privacy. Now, from a mate purely materialistic point of view, maybe India is a better place because then you can get, someone will come and vacuum your house or someone will uh, bring grocery for you or someone will cook food for you. Uh, so yes, you can have a better life. From a purely materialistic point of view, you can have a better life. But I don't consider materialistic life to be the purpose of my life. I want liberty. I want freedom of space. And uh, I want to be able to have my own time when no one knocks my door and no one... Um, uh, infringes on my personal space. So I'm not a big fan of servants. Uh, but Pratham, you can actually, I, I have found a mid, mid, middle way for myself. So I'm not a big fan of, um, you know, uh, cleaning my house or folding my clothes. So I can still pay people uh, in the West, in where I live to get my job done. So uh, I can get all the facilities that you say a rich person can enjoy in India. Uh, while I'm living in the West, I can drive my car, of course, by myself. But re remember, driving is so easy in the West. I have no problems with traffic there. Yeah. Speaking of uh, irrationality, what are your thoughts on the Nupur Sharma incident in India? Well, uh, Pratham, when uh, in India, because everything is so entangled, uh, you have to, like an onion, you have to keep peeling off what is happening here. Uh, and there is no one who is correct here. So 
in a rational society, you will have an offending party and a victim because mm -hmm. the rules are clear and the and the behavior or the moral concepts are clear. But in this country, there is no there are pe there's no moral value in this country. There's no concept of the truth in this country. So there is everything is extraordinarily entangled. So let's start with the latest thing I read, which was the Supreme Court judge saying that Nupur Sharma is solely responsible for whatever is happening in terms of riots and murders. Now, Nupur Sharma is not responsible for it. Uh, the judge, the, the, the judge's job is not to judge Nupur Sharma on the consequences of what happened after what she said. Uh, the people who rioted and murdered are the people who are responsible for it. So Nupur Sharma is completely innocent from the legal point of view, as far as I can see. In fact, she should be completely free uh, and she has the right to speak her mind. So you start with a legal system which is so corrupt and so obscene that the judge of the Supreme Court has no understanding of freedom of his speech and has no understanding of people's ability to speak their mind. Now, uh, did the did Nupur Sharma did the right thing? Uh, hey, I did not even listen to what she said, uh, but I know that she is just a cockroach who is trying to get votes of gullible Hindus. Uh, uh, so uh, Nupur Sharma does not even deserve to be cleaning my toilets. Uh, so, but but she was a senior politician in BJP then look at how spineless the whole BJP structure yeah. was mm -hmm. that a few small Muslim countries protested to Modi and they all mm -hmm. started groveling in front of those uh, countries. Modi, in fact, ended up visiting UAE to please the, mm -hmm. the rulers of the Ara Arabic countries because India gets oil from them. Now, you talk about this great Hindu Rashtra mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have no spine, no courage, and you have no value, no honor behind your great um, Hindu Rashtra propaganda. And the reality is that none of these politicians believe in a great Hindu Rashtra. What they want is votes of stupid, gullible, uh, xenophobic Hindus. So now uh, you, you see that the just, judges uh, judge has no concept of what law may, what the rule of law means. Uh, BJP is a spineless, uh, corrupt polit body. Nupur Sharma was completely innocent in terms of what she is being blamed for, uh, but she's an, an, just a cockroach who is trying to go up the ladder of politics supported by an extremely immoral, amoral and irrational masses. So who is correct here? They are all wrong people. I don't want to support any of them. And then let's talk about Muslims. Uh, hey, wake mm -hmm. up. Uh, if, if someone is saying anything about uh, your, uh, your priest or prophet, uh, your job is not to do vigilante justice. Uh, your job is either to shut your ears down, not mm. listen to the other person, because people will speak their mind. And you look like fools by supporting uh, uh, lynching of uh, people. So the guy who got killed in Udaipur did not deserve to be killed. Yeah. Nupur Sharma does not deserve to live a, fear, uh, a life of fear. So these... Uh, Fundament, Islamic fundamentalists should also be taught a lesson, but we are doing none of these things. The mm -hmm. judge basically gave a free reign to the Islamic uh, fundamentalism. So nothing is right here, really. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think uh, everyone are hypocrites here and BJP can, they are basically trying to get uh, votes from the gullible Indians, gullible Hindus. Whereas uh, Muslims, especially the representatives of Muslim community, are also hypocrites because they play the victim card when it's convenient for them, when they are getting beaten up. At the same time, they advocate for beating up of people who they disagree with. 
So, uh, and, and Pratham, I might add, I, I went to visit a family yesterday, a close friends, uh, friends, uh, some a family relationship of mine. And they were talking about, they were rationalizing why it's perfectly fine for the police to uh, kill uh, Muslim uh, uh, criminals in encounters. You know, the fake encounters that um, Indian police is well known for. So you also see that the problem is not a Hindu Muslim issue. Indians, irrespective of their religion, are irrational and amoral. They have no concept of moral values. So they just go along with what is expedient for them. Now, this family which I was visiting yesterday, when they said that it's perfectly fine for police to kill Muslim criminals, what they don't understand is that that is exactly why the police in, in India is so extraordinarily corrupt and incompetent. Uh, and eventually, those corrupt and incompetent people are going to go after these uh, Hindus who are rationalizing killing of Muslim criminals. Now, I'm not saying Muslim criminals should not be killed, but they should go through a proper process of judiciary. Uh, police does not have the right to touch you. It isn't their job. Yeah. So... In India, is diversity our strength or our weakness? Because a lot of liberal, secular Indians say diversity is our strength, but it seems obvious now that it's not. Uh, well, India is uh, uh, an unmitigated dis disaster because of the diversity it has. Um, the India is probably one of the most multi-ethnic societies on the planet. Uh, and none of these people like each other. You know, Maharashtrians don't like Biharis, Hindus don't like Muslims, Shia don't like Sunni, uh, Jains don't like uh, Hindus, Sikhs don't consider themselves Hindu, uh, people from the South don't like people from the North, people from the Gujaratis don't like Biharis. You know, no two Indians like each other. And that is the problem. So it is not even a problem of um, your language or your religion. The fundamental problem is that irrespective of your religion or language, you just don't like the other person. And the person you hate the most is the person who is closest to you because that is exactly the person who envies you the most and who wants to exploit you. Because every Indian wants to run life of every other Indian. So the biggest problem you have in your life is the person who is closest to you. Yeah. So uh, like you said, you know, South, South Indians don't like North Indians, Gujaratis don't like Biharis and so on and so forth. So would we benefit greatly from uh, disintegration? And this, I hope no one finds a sedition case on us for discussing this. Well, listen, I am a Canadian citizen and I can fly the flag of, uh, let's say, British Columbia in Canada and say I want a separation of British Columbia from Canada. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, no Canadian will go against me because they understand that it is within my rights to ask for a separate uh, state for myself. As long as I can get enough votes to su to support my independent existence, so uh, you look at uh, Western countries. Uh, Scotland has uh, consistently voted for; uh, they have had votes on whether they should become a separate country or not. Similarly, Quebec in Canada has had votes on whether it should become a separate country. So there's no problem in those countries. And I think Indians should understand it as well, that it does not matter to me whether Punjab is a part of India or not a part of India, because it does not belong to me anyway. As long as I can visit Punjab, that's all that matters to me. As long as I can invest in Punjab, that's all that matters to me. How does it matter to me whether my bureaucrat controls Punjab or the other bureaucrat controls Punjab, remembering that all these bureaucrats are thoroughly corrupt. I mean, these are the most spineless, immoral people who run the bureaucracy and politics of India. From A to Z, Z there is not one honest bureaucrat or politician in this country. So how does it matter? So really, Pratham, I think Indians should evolve the concept of letting people go who want to go. 
they should be able to secede from India, become independent, uh, but peacefully so that uh, we can then interact with those people as independent countries. And it doesn't really matter whether, whether uh, let's say, Tamil Nadu is a part of India or not, as long as we can do normal uh, uh, communication, normal transactions, what's the problem with whether administratively it's a separate country? I think the one fear of Indians, especially Hindus, is that succession uh, will cause a lot of violence, which has happened with uh, Pakistan when Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, seceded. And uh, with Punjab, yes, what difference does it make if Tamil Nadu or Punjab become separate as long as I can visit or uh, as long as I can invest there? But let's say some state like Kashmir, if they become a separate uh, state, it's obvious that I will not be able to visit uh, Kashmir and it's also obvious that uh, the majority uh, of population in Kashmir won't be you know nice to the minorities which is the reason I believe majority of Indians fear it well and that's why I initially said to you that I I see no hope in India mm. because whether you stay as a single country you are, you are filled with hatred now mm. Indians are filled with hatred they talk about all this grand spirituality uh, and they put uh, Sanskrit shlok on their Twitter account to show how uh, how uh, spiritual they are. Uh, but they are filled with envy and hatred for every other person. So there's no solution to this. You keep this country together, we hate each other. You break this country apart, we hate each other. So there's no solution to this problem. The problem is in the Indian psyche. The Indian psyche is that it does. It is an immoral psyche, it is a, an irrational psyche, and it does not want to open up. In, in fact, Indian psyche is getting closed and more closed as time has gone by. But was India always like this? Was there ever a time in our history where we were doing better and the, Europe or some other uh, civilization was doing terrible? Well, there's no history uh, when India by itself was doing better than what it is doing during the British or Mughal times. Uh, so uh, remember that uh, Mughal control of India was a massive improvement on what India was before the Mughals came to the country. A lot of clothes that you consider to be Indian clothes are not Indian clothes. They have Persian and a non-Indian uh, origin. A lot of our food is not of Indian origin. It is in many ways Muslim and Islamic and Persian uh, background. Uh, mm -hmm. Mughals were big contributors in teaching India to clothe up. Uh, clothing up wasn't necessarily uh, big among Indians. Uh, so in my view, the Mughal rule over over India was an improvement on India and European rule over India was a massive, massive improvement uh, on India. Uh, since the time British has left, however, India has continued to degrade. Uh, and that is why I think India has is continuing to degrade. It's getting worse and worse and it will face horrendous problems going forward. Now, Pratham, you will often hear from people that uh, the British stole $45 trillion from India. And that has become an accepted um, view of people all the way from Shashi, uh, Shashi Tator to uh, and the average Indian walking on the street. I asked them, have you tried looking at those numbers, where those numbers came from? And I did try looking at those numbers. And they make absolutely no sense. Because that number was created by, by a Marxist Indian who decided to live in a country ruled by white people. She lives in the US. Why, if she thinks that white people are such ex exploiters, why is she living in, in the US? Why, not, why is she not in India? So that $45 trillion is completely fake. And I tell you one aspect of it which should convince you that it's completely fake that $45 trillion increases by 5% every year. Now that 5% becomes more than $2 trillion increase every year. So she's increasing her number by more than the current GDP of India every year. Now that simply doesn't add up. It's a stupid number, which makes no sense. Now people talk about uh, the fact that Indian economy was 25% or whatever of the world's economy in the uh, 500 years back. And 
that was very likely correct. But that does not change the fact that your GDP per capita those days was still about $300 or $400 per capita. You were still wearing a fig leaf and eating apples from the apple tree. In a tropical country, you will have more agricultural output and more output from forests in the already because tropics give you the free gift of agricultural products. So yes, compared to the cold, frozen climates of uh, uh, United Kingdom or Finland or Sweden, yes, per cap, the GDP of India was probably 25% uh, and it has fallen significantly since then as a pro proportion of the world GDP. But on GDP per capita basis, Indian GDP has continued to increase because British brought in industrialization to India. India grew rapidly under the British. And because of technology that they left behind, it is just that compared to the rest of the world, India fell behind. But only in comparison, we should still be thankful to the British for, for bringing in technology. Now, imagine what India would have been if Europeans had never part, had never come to India. There is no sign that India would have moved a step forward from what it was in the medieval times. So that should tell you that British occupation of India was a huge, huge benefit for India. Uh, contrary to this xenophobic view that has come to exist uh, in the country today. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess European colonization did have a lot of benefits, but the, the argument that can be made against uh, praising the Mughals is that, yes, they built the Taj Mahal, yes, they gave us a lot of clothes and uh, the cuisine, but uh, they, uh, they murdered and raped a lot of Indians. They looted our temples and whatnot. So was it really worth it? Okay, yeah. So go out of your uh, current uh, place where you are sitting and you will see uh, rapes and murders and uh, is theft going nonstop in this country. Uh, Indians, you know, you look, go to social media, Indians constantly threaten people, for, uh, women with gang rape. Uh, but they think it's a matter of prestige for them to be threatening women with gang rape. Um, try giving a lakh rupee to, uh, to an Indian and see if that money comes back to you. You're constantly under assault. So how were Mughals any worse? Now, maybe they were worse, but provide me facts on this. Uh, the fact remains that every Indian is after your wealth. Every Indians are culturally dishonest people and they will steal your money so why blame others for stealing your money when you yourself steal money from other people yeah okay yeah and uh, the argument that i would make against these people the the hindu nationalists is that they say that uh, before the british came or before the mughals came we were uh, culturally uh, superior technologically superior and this and that and I asked them, okay, if we were such a strong country, then why were we so easily invaded? If we were really a smart people, then we would have colonized Europe, we would have colonized Africa, but that didn't happen. The opposite happened. So it logically doesn't make sense. Well, so uh, Pratham, uh, Indian his Indians have no sense of history. So let, let me repeat this. India have Indians have no sense of history. It was British who discovered most of our history while they ruled this country. Indians did not have the concept of museums. They did not preserve their palaces and castles. Those historical buildings were deteriorating over time. Remember, uh, the Khajurao disappeared in the forest because Indians had no interest in history. It was the British who gave us an understanding of history. Now, what is there to be proud of? Uh, you, what you really need to understand the history of India is to read books by people like Neerat Chaudhary, V.S. Naipaul, mm -hmm. uh, a book called uh, The Land of Lingam, uh, or Mulkraj Anand. And these are the people who wrote about uh, the, the past of India. 
And then you realize that no, India always was a wretched place. And Mughal rule over the country and uh, British rule over the country were both improvements on what India was before these people came. And British rule was a, a significant improvement over uh, Mughal rule. So I'm not in favor of a religious occupation of the country. But uh, Mughals were not as bad as now this Hindu fanatics, fanatics want to show themselves to be compared to what the Hindu rulers were like who were complete exploiters. There's no, there's hardly a good Hindu ruler who ruled that country, this country. So they were exploiters and rapists already. So again, the question is in what way were Mughal any worse than the Hindu rulers that we have, uh, that, that we had. Now, a lot of those Hindu ru rulers have been glorified on Indian TV and this, uh, the, you know, all, all the, uh, crazy romanticism, uh, romantic romanticization of Indian history that has gone through the Indian TV. Uh, but that is not real history. That is just romanticization of, uh, of the past. Okay. Um, but hasn't there been any good kingdoms in the past? The glorification usually happens around kings like uh, you know, Shivaji or the Vijayanagara Empire. And uh, when you hear stories about the past kingdoms, about how wealthy we were or uh, contributions to uh, certain fields like architecture and science. So there has been some uh, good uh, kingdoms, right? <laughs> of the 543 princely states uh, there were in 47, there must have been a couple that were really good. Well, I mean, look, from what I know, the, the rule of Ranjit Singh over what was Punjab was a decent rule. Uh, so yes, absolutely, there were good principalities and good kingdoms, uh, but overall, India was uh, an extremely exploitative place, and um, it became much better under the British. Uh, remember, the concept of human rights or giving dignity to women or giving dignity to, to every human beings, the concept of scientific method, these are all European concepts. Uh, now, Europeans had their bad side, and I'm not saying that they did not uh, design uh, uh, the, the poisonous gases or they did not slaughter people. But if at all, if at all you look, go around looking for something good that happened in humanity, which is uh, giving rights to an individual, dignity to human people, bringing in the concept of revelation and reason, these are all European concepts. We did not have those. Mm. Uh, you mentioned VS Nepal and, uh, you know, I had, uh, I have in a free state by VS Nepal and I was uh, talking to with uh, a friend of mine a couple of years ago who he uh, studied in a liberal arts uh, college, a prominent liberal arts college here in India. And I asked him, hey, have you read VS Nepal? Uh, to which he said, no, I've never read it and I'll probably never read it, even though he has a Nobel uh, Prize in Literature because... Uh, a lot of people who go to these liberal arts college pursue people like Nepal uh, to be a racist or a right-wing person. And they, that's how they'll perceive you too. They, if they listen to you speak, they'll say, okay, you know what, Jayant is a racist, xenophobic, right-wing person. Well, Indians are not interested in the truth. If I claimed that British stole $100 trillion from India, I would be more that hundred trillion dollar will immediately gain traction in the country because Indians want to believe about their glorious past, a past that did not exist. Um, so we are not seekers of truth. Uh, again, Indians are not seekers of truth. We want to whine, we want to blame other peoples, and we want to talk about how what how glorious our society was in the past. We don't want to accept the responsibilities that India has been so-called independent for the last 75 years now. And what have we achieved? Nothing. We're dependent on Western technology, even today. Yeah. Uh, another uh, thing that people will probably tell to you or even to me, if we justify uh, British rule, is that you're a British bootlicker or you have been brainwashed by the, you, you've been uh, brainwashed by the colonizers. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, so Pratham, uh, it's a, it's a uh, misunderstanding that uh, even if I did that erroneously, I would be licking boots of the British. British don't like to hear what I say because the Western society has become very politically correct and they don't want to hear these good things about the colonial past. So um, there is no reason why this should be seen as uh, licking boots of the British. This is ignorance of Indians that makes them think that when I say this, I'm licking boots of the British. I'm a seeker of the truth. I'm just speaking the truth because without understanding the truth, there's no hope for India. Uh, and again, as I said, I see no hope from India because I know Indians cannot be changed into seekers of the truth. They have no interest except for sex and food. These are the two driving forces of an average Indian. And he is not interested in ideas. He's interested in talking about politics only to the extent that it can make him feel good about himself. That's the limit of an Indian's psyche. Okay. Uh, Europe has been through a lot of uh, improvements in the past centuries. They went through the Renaissance. They, went, uh, they had their reformation. Do you think Hindu society in India will have a reformation where Finally, you know, after the Reformation, we will get rid of the caste system. We'll get rid of the uh, uh, we'll get rid of the internal hatred, and we'll finally clean up our act. Well, f firstly, I wouldn't talk about the caste system at all. I wouldn't focus on getting rid of the caste system. We have to see how the society evolves. We can't really do a top-down uh, change in the society. You have to wake people up before the caste system can go away. Uh, the reality is, Pratham, that the lower caste people are no saints. Uh, most of what you read in the newspaper about the caste problem is actually fights between two lower caste groups trying to, uh, trying to show to the other person who is higher caste among these two lower caste people. If you see the foot soldiers of the fanatics, Hindu fanatics today, most of them are from the lower caste. So yeah. uh, if you go to the government offices today, we are highly incompetent, stupid, and extremely corrupt people now sit. Most of them are from the lower caste. So if you think caste system can be removed through a top-down method, it will actually only worsen the country. Now, can India improve? Well, theoretically, yes, but practically it will never happen. Uh, what was happening is that um, in, the, in the 19th century, under the rule and the structure provided by the British, um, people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy came into existence who were trying to fight against uh, the cultural backwardness of Indians. Now, Indians, believe me, trust me, and read about it were extraordinarily backward. So don't be fooled by these glorified TV series and you know the great uh, princes or kings of India. Virtually none of them was great. Uh, I talked about Ranjit Singh, but only in comparison to the other principalities and kings. These were all pathetic exploiters. Now, can India change? Yes, we should have kept British in the country because they gave a rational institutional structure for India within which people like Raja Ram Mohan Rai, Radhindranath Tagore could rise up. And that is why it was those, uh, those people were seen to be behind what was called Bengal Renaissance. And it all died out the moment um, we started having this so-called independence movement and the so-called independence from the British because the moral structure can Came, fell apart, our institutions got hollowed out, and truly stupid junkies have now come to rule in the government, in politics, in the judiciary, in the police system. We have true brain dead junkies sitting in all these offices. So, any Indian who talks about how great India is today should at least go and visit a government office in India and try to get some work done and see what happens to him. 
and you will see that more, all these Indians, they go to a government office and they're obsequious, they plead, they grovel in front of the bureaucrats. And then you talk about this greatness of India. Uh, you are slaves of the bureaucracy of, of the country today. Hmm. Uh, a respected economic analyst, uh, Ruchir Sharma, had uh, once said, uh, India disappoints both optimists and pessimists. Uh, would you agree with this statement that pessimists are also wrong to a certain extent about India and that India has achieved some things to its credit? Uh, well, uh, uh, Pratham, I am actually still looking. Uh, you, someone has to explain to me what has India achieved to its credit. Uh, I don't see anything. So if you can mention an, uh, an, an, uh, uh, an isolated event or uh, a scientific discovery, you know, something big that India achieved. I mean, we talk about these uh, moon mission and we stopped talking about it because it failed. We talked about uh, Mars mission because we couldn't, you know, everything fails. So we make a huge hue and cry about what we are going to do. And then it disappears. We talk about smart cities. We no longer talk about smart cities because uh, those smart cities are packed with potholes and there's no uh, th th there's nothing in those smart cities. So we talk about all these glorious things and we fool ourselves and then we forget and then we move on to something else. Uh, two years back, you, Uttar Pradesh government came out with uh, a massive amount of gold they had found in the ground. They had found nothing. They just wanted to, you know, the TV watching Indians, gullible Indians love listening to these news. It keeps them entertained for a while. But again, tell me something that India should be recognized for. Yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, a lot of gullible Indians send WhatsApp forwards about how our country is becoming a Vishwaguru or Akand Bharat and this and that and all that rubbish. But uh, uh haven't we achieved some things at least like a, uh, even i can't think honestly well, uh, well and that explains it and and i and, and, and pratham i'm sure there are a couple of things but you can't if you can't think of some, a few things right away when one out of five people on the planet is an indian there's a problem we are not creative people we are not focused on uh building a civilization we are uh, we are not uh, discoverers uh, instinctively yeah uh, that's uh, funny because another thing that indians uh, send forwards on whatsapp about is how indians are doing really well abroad how indian uh, ceo of uh, microsoft is doing well how an indian ceo of google is doing well so a lot of the pride also comes when indians do well abroad which is actually something to be ashamed of because it goes to prove that we are incompetent with our own system that we have to go abroad. And uh, we, we say that the white people, uh, the, the British and the Americans did a lot of bad things, but we actually depend on them for our success abroad. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, firstly, five or 10 or 15 smart Indians come up, that is that should happen. I mean, after all, we are five, one out of five human beings on the planet. Um, and why is it that every good Indian that you talk about lives in the US or, or in other Western countries? It does not show greatness of India. It just shows greatness of the US and the Western society that they provided a structure for these Indians to rise, rise up in the society. Okay. What about, uh, I know that a lot of, uh things like Swachh Bharat and smart cities are all exaggerated ideas which have failed. They're all <laughs> cover-ups. But uh, hasn't there been some success like uh, Digital India, for example? Now every uh, Indian, even the poorest shopkeeper knows how to make uh, electronic transactions. Isn't that uh, isn't that a advancement? Uh, well, uh, absolutely. And it's a technology that came from the West. It's it's a copy and paste technology that has come from the West and from China, actually. Uh, this the, the, They established uh, uh, electronics. They established internet. They established computers. The web is their product. Uh, they, they, they brought in the concept of financial transactions. So this is all Western technology that we have copied and pasted. So what is 
our greatness here. And yes, uh, I completely agree. The electronic transactions have become very common in the country. But remember, Pratham, there's more cash in India today than there was uh, when demonetization happened. So uh, what is the why did we get rid of cash? Go to Japan, go to Singapore. People constantly use cash. What is the problem with cash? There's no problem with cash. There shouldn't be any problem with cash. The only reason some countries want to reduce, particularly uh, crazy countries like India that want to reduce uh, cash is because they, they claim they want to reduce corruption. There's more corruption today than there was in the past. So corruption has continued to increase. And what has Modi done to rein in on bureaucrats? He wants you to pay more and more taxes, but has he fired a single bureaucrat for corruption? Is there a functioning vigilance office in the country? Can you go to a vigilance office and complain about the bribes that you have to pay? There's nothing. Can you complain to a super, uh, um, uh, an organization that uh, oversees the affairs of the police and complain about the brutalities of the police, the, the fake encounters that they do. Or for example, just yesterday, the Udaipur uh, event where this uh, two fanatics killed uh, uh, a Hindu, th those fanatics were badly beaten up by uh, uh, some activists. Why was police not there to protect these criminals? Police's job is not to bring these criminals into public square to be beaten up. Their job is to safely take them to the court. So again, the, the problem is that um, the, the, I, I simply see don't see a moral structure in the country. You can be proud of uh, the technology and the software engineers we have created, but they are all copies and pasted stuff. And even the software engineers that we are so proud of is something that is increasingly uh, being overtaken by China and Philippines and other countries, and we are losing ground very, very rapidly. And Indians mostly do the background, low-level software work for the Western society. So there's nothing to be proud about this financial technology and the transaction technology that we have today. Okay. Uh, also, uh, here in India, we have imported the worst values of the West. We didn't import rational thinking or neat infrastructure from the West, but we did manage to import wokeism and the LGBTQ agenda. Uh, on the other hand, East Asian countries like Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, etc., they've imported the good values from the West. Why are we Indians so attracted to Western garbage? Well, because that garbage is inherently an Indian uh, way of life. Um, what happened was, Pratham, is that you again go back 500 years back. What we see as vocism is what was the culture of India those days. We were changed by uh, the, the Mughal uh, control over, over the country, and we were significantly changed by the Victorian morals that came through the British. Uh, but a lot of our family traditions are not originally Indian. They, are, they have a British background. Uh, as I often say, what we consider to be good things about Hinduism or let's say Brahmins is nothing but Christianization of Hinduism. This is what was this brought in by people like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Rabindranath Tagore kind of people. So there's nothing, you know, there's there's nothing to be so proud about uh, the background. Sorry, I, I, I forgot your question there. Yeah, we... Uh... Anyways, uh, yeah. Uh, why you you were asking about why we uh, copy the f the bad aspects the, of the Western society? Because that is how India functioned historically, and that is how we his we function today. Indians are driven by base instincts. They are driven by food and sex. They have no interest in ideas. So the greatness of Western society would be invisible to them because they are not interested in great people. They are not interested in great ideas. They are interested in Kim Kardashian or they are inter interested in pornography stars. Uh, and, and that's what they copy. Uh, and they think that copying this superficial materialistic aspect of the Western society would make them westernized. 
So you see these girls uh, uh, very sometimes, in my view, very stupidly wearing very short clothes or you know trying to overact their what they think is their westernized ways. But what they are doing is basically copying the lowest common denominator of the Western society because they simply cannot see that the Western society is Western, not because of those low class aspects, but because of the ideas and the philosophy and the Christianity that uh, Western society has had. OK, uh, I, you seem to uh, push this idea that uh, Indians have not created anything original and we are we have copied a lot from other countries. But in the past, just to give an example, haven't we created some things that are original, like could be the Vedas or the Upanishads or some of our scriptures with, that have even inspired uh, people outside? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, um, so, uh, all I said, Pratham, was that I asked you a question and you could not come up with an idea about what great thing Indians created. And I fully agree. There must be, uh, there, there is, there's a lot of uh, great Indian uh, spiritual texts. Um, how many people follow those? Yeah. Uh, how Absolutely. many people have read those? How many people, I, I know only one post, one Indian in my life who has read Upanishads. Mm. Yeah. How many Indians have you met who have read that? So we don't even know our own history. You are not here of that history if you have not even read that. Now, I have been following, uh, practicing Vipassana for the last 35 years. How many people do that? So, so yes, there is greatness. There are some great things Indians have done. But remember, we are one out of five people on the planet and if in the last 5000 years we have created some good things there's nothing to be proud about we want to be proud about ourselves what have we contributed to this human society and what is india's contribution towards the human society today and my response is nothing negligible in comparison to the number of indians that exist on the planet today yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with you. Even most Hindu fanatics or the cutter Hindus have probably never read Vedas or Upanishads. Oh, they have. They have certainly not read it because they would not be uh, the stupidities that they do on the streets is not a product of someone who could uh, in discipline have gone through Upanishads and Vedas. So would we Hindus benefit from actually returning to our re uh, roots reading uh, sanskrit or uh, practicing vipassana uh, and reading the vedas and upanishads uh, sending our kids to gurukul schools so so you are completely mistaken if you think those are our roots those were followed by a very very negligible minority of indians uh, indian spiritual practices were followed by a insignificant minority the roots of India are feral. Indian roots are all about exploitation. You can go back into the history as much as you want. Indian history is all about exploitation and abusing other people. And Indian society has always been feral. Feral means a society without uh, moral values. It was, a, it was a jungle raj in the country always. Uh, just because a minor an insignificant minority followed the concept of gurukuls and vipassana and vedas and upanishads does not reflect uh, is not does not mirror the culture of of india of the yeah. past I, i'm trying i'm trying to explore solutions here because even in europe uh, there was a lot of uh, you know there was a lot of feral uh, rule even in europe but gradually because of enlightenment and because of renaissance uh, these uh, the ideals of a few spread to the common man in Europe, which is why they have a better civilization today. Can we do the same in India, where if uh, we spread uh, Vedas and Upanishads and Vipassana, some of our original spiritual ideas to the common man, could we have a renaissance here? Well, firstly, uh, Indians are not interested in uh, higher ideas. They are interested in food and sex. These are the two driving forces of an Indian and power of, over other people. So if you think India can ever 
by doing some magical institutional changes can ever become America or Ch even China. Forget about it. It's not going to happen. But can we improve ourselves? Absolutely, we can improve the country. Bring the British back to the country. Offer the best talent in the world to come and run this country. Hong Kong, Singapore, United Arab Emirates constantly do it. They bring in the best talent from around the world to, to run their institutions. Why can Indians not do it? We have a chaiwala running this country. And you can, you know, hopefully I won't go to prison for calling him chaiwala because uh, he sees that as a sign of uh, accomplishment. Uh, the pro problem is that our institutions and the people who run this country are completely completely morally and intellectually bankrupt try to understand their psyche and see that they are taking in india to a complete disaster so you have to change who runs our institutions and we simply do not have the skilled population to run the institutions here we have to bring in a hundred thousand best talents from around the world to run this country hmm. i don't think that's ever going to happen anyway and that's why pratham that's why i said i have no hope from india uh, and that is why i discourage my clients from investing in the country uh, they do, do invest in the country but in very specific narrow areas but i generally don't i don't i tell them to start with that india has no future and indians have no future a smart Indian guy that I meet, I usually tell him that if you have the right values, emigrate because you have no place in this society. Mm. Yeah, I'll I'll come to that later uh, about how a smart Indian should behave. Uh, let's move to another topic, which is what are your opinions on the LGBTQIA plus community and the gay pride month that uh, concluded recently? Well, uh, I mean, this is... Uh, Third world, this is a way to convert the first world into the third world. Uh, this uh, LGBTQ plus list keeps going up on and on. Um, and now uh, you are uh, making uh, children uh, confused about their gender by teaching them about things that they, have, they are psychologically not prepared, not understand capable of understanding. So the population of people who claim to be LGBTQ++ have uh, doubled almost 10, 10 years or almost every 20 years in the Western society. The problem is that they that is nothing but the federal aspect of the Western society taking over leadership of the Western culture. Uh, this will have a horrendously negative effect on, on the West. Uh, but remember, most of what, what is happening in the West in terms of this woke culture and LGBTQ is nothing alien to the third world countries. This is what we were like uh, 500 years back, feral people. And they are, uh, we are now seeing increasing uh, 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 following a part of the Western civilization because of the feral wokeism that has come to exist in the western society yes uh the wokeism and the lgbtq agenda and the propaganda in u.s schools and uh, trans women participating tr biological males participating in women's sports seems to be uh deteriorating the western civilization but to go in a more conspiratorial uh, angle do you think there is a conspiracy uh to destroy western civilization uh, I, I don't see a conspiracy behind this, uh, and I'm sure there are conspiracies in the world, but I don't see a conspiracy behind this. Uh, I, I think the biggest problem is democracy. Uh, democracy uh, destroys meritocracy. Uh, democracy is by definition an anti-meritocratic system. It is when that bottom 51% of the people rule the society. I would say 90% of any society is not interested in ideas or philosophy or public policy. So when 51% of those people rule the society, you will see hollowing out of the institutions. So there's no conspiracy. It's just that 
the kind of people who have risen up in power, people like Justin Trudeau or Biden or Kamala Harris, they are uh, low IQ um, uh, people who have no interest in ideas. They are only interested in votes and they have base instincts. They are driven by sex and food again and power and lust for power. Um, and they are the people who have similar psychology. So it might seem like as if they are conspiring to destroy the Western civilization. But uh, because of this institutional structure that we have provided, we have created uh, a space for the worst kind of people to emerge in the Western society. And similarly, in India, you might say, is there a conspiracy in India to implant corrupt people in the country? No, there's no conspiracy because we have democracy and we don't have good leaders everyone has become corrupt in the government institutions every single person i've ever met in the government is corrupt mm -hmm. so it's no conspiracy it's just a natural consequence yeah what's your opinion on uh, the removal of uh, the the roe versus wade uh, the roe versus wade conclusion by the us supreme court well uh, what i like about it is that at least america is still continues to have its own views it's a society that believes in certain moral values and it believes in not going woke. Now, uh, the, the whole concept of abortion is a disgusting concept. Uh, we should know that it should not happen. Now, I don't know whether the Supreme Court of the US is the best place to judge that, but given the institutional structure that we have, I'm certainly proud that americans are doing something which is uh, not full which is in which is not in terms of following the woke feral culture that has increasingly dominated our societies yeah absolutely yeah same here uh what's your opinion on the sri lankan crisis and do you think they have any they have a better future ahead <laughs> uh, Pratham, I was in Sri Lanka early this year. Um, I, I absolutely loved being in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka feels like a first world country if you go to Sri Lanka from India. Uh, mm -hmm. GDP per capita of India is twice as much as that of India. Uh, Sri Lankans are um, much nicer people compared to Indians. Uh, so yes, I had a good time in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, there are sidewalks in Sri Lanka, for example. Okay. I can walk around uh, on the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. In India, I can't walk around. I, if I have to go two blocks, I have to uh, take a taxi and uh, because I, I don't like to walk on the street. So Sri Lanka is a, div is a much nicer country compared to India. Those Indians who are feeling proud about how stable Indian currency is or how great India is compared to Sri Lanka are, again, morons. They are idiots who have who should go to india to sri lanka and see what sri lanka is all about the only reason sri lanka looks worse in the media today is because people in sri lanka often come out on the street to fight with their politicians about corruption that they have mm -hmm. when have you pratham seen indians coming on the street to fight against the corruption when they have when they have when ever in the last 45 years, 75 years, have they dragged a politician, a bureaucrat out of his office for, for his venality and corruption. Sri Lankans do it. So we should be proud of Sri Lanka, not look down at Sri Lanka. Okay. Uh, and do you think uh, that they will come out uh, with, a better, uh, with better prospects? Well, I mean, uh, anything saying better, uh, anything, uh, hoping for anything better from a third world country is uh, not a legitimate thing to do. And there's a very uh, straight reason behind it. All the countries that had the potential to become developed countries have shown that potential. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last 100 years, Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, they were all obscenely poor uh, backward countries. They have become first world countries. In the last 30 years, China has shown itself to be a country that has a potential to be a first world country. North Korea, 
has a potential to be a first world country once uh, Kim uh, Kim Il Sung is gone. So what can become first world countries have either become first world countries or we can identify those countries today. Vietnam has a potential to be a second world country. But uh, any, any expecting anything much better from Sri Lanka than what it is, is deluding ourselves. So when I said nice things about Sri Lanka, I said it in comparison to India, a hellhole of India. Sri Lanka has twice the GDP. It's a much better place than India. But if you think Sri Lanka will improve from where it is today, that's again deluding yourself. The only hope historically that was for the third world countries, and that includes most of Latin America, all of Africa, and all of South Asia, was European occupation of these countries. Uh, do third world countries where people have low moral standards benefit from authoritarian leaders? Uh, well, uh, listen, uh, it, it's a very tough thing to respond to because uh, how do you get a moral authoritarian leader to come to exist? It's an extremely difficult job. So, you know, look at Pakistan or look at uh, India. We have authoritarian leaders here, but are they people with any kind of morals? Is Mo Does Modi know the concept of morality? I tell you, no, he has absolutely no clue about it. Now, is Bangladesh a more, uh, Bangladesh is also authoritarian, but, but does the leaders of Bangladesh have more morals compared to the leaders we have in India? The answer is yes, because the current leadership of Bangladesh is able to provide a better rule of law in that country, the result of which is that Bangladesh is among the fastest, probably the fastest growing economy in South Asia. It, it's it, per capita GDP is much higher than that of India and Pakistan. So, and you know, we should be looking at facts. I'm proud of Bangladeshis. I'm proud of Bangladeshi leadership because they have done better than the rest of South uh, Asians. Again, you can have authoritarian dictators who can do a good job. Uh, Singapore did something similar with authoritarian rule. So Hong Kong under authoritarian rule of British did very well. Uh, but democracy is guaranteed to bring you down eventually because it's the rule of the masses. It's fundamentally anti-meritocratic. Mm, yeah. Is someone like uh, Bolsonaro doing a good job in Brazil because he's also an authoritarian conservative? Uh, well, uh, so I have, uh, you know, Brazil is one of the rare countries that I have never been to. And I really like to look at everything from close distance before I judge a person. But Bolsonaro, it seems to me from whatever I have heard, has done a relatively better job, but he's on his way out. These third world wretched countries don't like good leaders. Good leaders get thrown out in these third world countries very quickly. Sri Lankan leadership is extraordinarily corrupt. I know people who have been very, very close to the top leadership in Sri Lanka, and I know they are extraordinarily corrupt. So uh, the problem is that um, the people of these third world countries do not vote because of the leadership qualities of their leaders. They vote on the basis of whether that person is a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, uh, lower caste, upper caste, male, female. They go for all the tribal reasons why they vote. And that's why uh, uh, th these people eventually end up uh, even if by luck they end up with good leaders, they will eventually remove them and replace them with uh, horrible people. Yeah. So I guess we don't deserve democracy. We deserve a philosopher king instead, a smart authoritarian leader. Yeah, but th that's not going to happen. I mean, I, I get uh, once in a while, some people ask me, why don't you join politics? I mean, what would happen to me if I joined politics, Pratham? I I'll be lucky if I get five votes. Mm. Yeah. Forget about becoming the prime minister of the country. I can't even win a local election. So, uh, and that is why I think the only hope for India is to get Europeans back into this country so that we can be run by relatively decent people. Okay. And uh, what are your thoughts on the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine war? Uh, well, uh, 
I don't take sides on either of with either of the two countries. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, Western governments had no business trying to expand NATO to the border of Russia. It is a part of their agreement with uh, you, Russia that NATO would not reach the border of Russia. They should have kept many of these countries neutral. Uh, so they have unnecessarily created this Ukraine-Russia problem. Also, uh, Crimea is not as as bad a thing that Russia did as it is claimed to be. Crimea is predominantly Russian. So Russia basically reorganized the, 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 the boundaries based on what it would have been had they not reorganized it during the times of, I think, Stalin. So... Uh, I don't have clear views on it. I don't take either sides because I find both sides horrible. Uh, I don't, when I look, pay closer attention to the leadership of Ukraine, I find them repulsive. And when I look closely at Putin, I find them repulsive. And this is the problem when you have an irrational, immoral institutional structure, you cannot def decide on who is wrong and who is right. And that is, of course, as I said, the case with India as well. How do you define whether Nupur Sharma is right or wrong, whether the judge is right or wrong? Because everyone seems to be on the wrong side here. Uh, let me read an interesting tweet from you uh, dated 23rd June. Trudeau is a moron, but he looks like a genius in comparison to the beloved Supreme Leader Modi, who himself looks like a God's gift when compared with his blind followers. And India has no one better than him. That tells you where India is headed, be skilled, and emigrate. <laughs> uh, like, uh, like, is that our only choice? Uh, yeah, well, uh, what has happened, Pratham, is that uh, we have had much better leadership than what we deserve to have. Uh, since the time, because the British left with us a system of checks and balances, which are mostly gone now, they kept in place institutions and they kept in place institutions which competed with each other to keep each other in place and not become too corrupt. They left in place a, a system that deteriorated slowly, but the underpinning culture is so amoral and so filled with envy and envy, hatred, and all the bad things that eventually Indian culture will reflect in our leadership. Modi is a horrible person. He is a Hindu fanatic. He has, he has done nothing good for India. But the problem is that today, if you look at the Indian leadership, you have no one better than Modi. So the, the, the next leader will make you nostalgic about Modi even though Modi is a horrible person. So the future of India is horrible as a result of it. And the reason is an average Indian who has no moral values, who has no integrity, who is dishonest. Okay. Uh, so a lot of young Indians will watch this podcast. What should they do for their future? Are they better off upskilling and leaving this country? Well, firstly, uh, very important for everyone is to be on the search for the truth. Just accept facts as they are. Once you know the facts as they are, maybe you will find a place for yourself in the society when you can, where you can live a life of dignity. Average Indian cannot have a life of dignity. Anyone who lives here knows it that you don't have a life of dignity. So look for facts, accept the facts as they are, and maybe you will discover a better way to live. Uh, now, you might continue to live in India, you might try to emigrate, you might fail to emigrate, uh, but if you don't have the search for truth as your compass, uh, you will have a degraded life in India and you will have a degraded life in the West. A lot of Indians live degraded lives in the Western society because they don't have the moral compass. So discover the moral compass, discover the compass of truth, and then it will take you in the right direction. Yeah, that's going to be very hard for a lot of Indians because we are not used to it. But uh, thank you, Jayant, for coming on the Labyrinth.